I offered the prayer that I did presenting some contrast between, in essence, what's going on in here versus what's going on out there, because I don't know about you, but I feel the difference in a very profound and, and visceral way. I never thought that the litany for ordinations, which can sometimes feel like a sort of dry old document, can I say that out loud? would become actually an act that could be interpreted as incendiary when we pray for those in public trust that they would serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person, that praying for the poor, the persecuted, the sick, all who suffer, refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger that they may be relieved and protected would be a countercultural thing to ask God to do. And yes, sisters and brothers, that's exactly where we are. And because it is where we are, it is more important than ever to listen to something that may not be culturally where we feel at home, but is a deep, deep, deep principle in the life of the gospel, which is the call to servanthood. Because if there is anything that these deacons represent to us in terms of the rest of the church, it's servanthood. And servanthood that is empowered from a source other than their talents and their gifts and their education and all of the other things that the world as well as we in the church like to admire. Because what we're really asking God to do tonight is actually sovereignly intervene from outside of time into this spot in time and as a result create a change in the lives of these who are being presented for ordination that they might reflect that eternal work being worked in and through them. There's an organization that I like quite a lot called Youth with a Mission. They have a phrase, and the phrase is called coming in the opposite spirit. And what they mean by that is that in the face of a culture that now more than ever is absolutely fascinated with material accumulation and the exaltation of personal power and the ends justifying the means for God to raise up a group of people who would say to that, no. We live by an eternal life to which we are completely and entirely indebted. It would be disloyal to the very God who sent his son to die and rose again for me to buy into that culture because it is completely antithetical to everything that Jesus stood for. So we're asking God to break in and to do something new that you might, in fact, be able to live out of a source different from you. For the sake of we, the body of Christ, who need to be reminded of the servant ministry to which we are all called, but also to a group of people out there whom God has his hand on, but yet do not know that the longing that God has placed in their hearts in fact can be found an answer for here in what God has shown us in Jesus Christ. You see, the field, as Jesus says in another passage, is the world. It's the world. Do you hear me? It's the world. It's not just the nice Episcopalians that you know. And if that is the case, you are trusting the fact that you are stepping out, not in here so much, but into the world, because that's a part of your call as deacons, especially trusting that God is going to bring on your path those people for whom he is already at work. Because God's doing all kinds of things in the world that may or may not be happening in here. Hello? and be alert to what God is doing in a way that allows you, as the servant that you have been called to be, to step into the flow of what God is doing in another person's life. Not to get what you want done, but to be a part of what God is doing in their life. 
and to lift up the name of Jesus, honoring the flow of what God is doing in them. It is, in fact, a servant ministry because what you are doing is yielding the authority of your right to be in control of your life, to set your own boundaries, to set your own course, to determine even how your day is going to go. I mean, I don't know about you, but (laughs) I wake up in the morning and I look at my phone to see what's on the calendar. But I know by now, God, I hope I do, that just because it's on the calendar doesn't mean that God isn't going to do something very different. And if what I'm trying to do is hold on to make sure that my calendar work gets done, I may actually miss the very thing that God wants to accomplish because His ways are not my ways. My ways are not His ways. And so I have to bend the knee to the flow of His Spirit in the world so that I have, in fact, the privilege, the privilege of somehow in a very small way being a part of what it is that God is doing in the world. Those sweet, sometimes heartbreaking, occasionally profoundly painful, often winsome encounters where the Spirit of God begins to move in the most unlikely ways and places, and you know that wherever it is that you are, whether you're in the line at Publix, whether you're at the feeding station at Christian Service Center, where you're sitting down and having coffee at a local barista, you're there by divine appointment. (laughs) You may not look any different than anybody else, but what's really happening is because you have yielded to Him. You're there in that moment saying, okay, Lord, what would you have me do? And trusting that even in the very small actions that you're able to so feebly contribute, God will take them like bread and break them and feed and use in a way that I have to confess to you, I find astonishing. In the world, what we're describing in some ways is a piece of the call of Jeremiah, the surprise of Jeremiah knowing that in the midst of being a tender of sycamore trees, God broke through. Before you were in the womb, I knew you and appointed you. Oh, yeah? I knew it was enough to take his breath away. Walter Brueggemann puts it this way about the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a stunning reflection on the power of God's Word to order historical events. In other words, God's work both in and through Jeremiah, as well as his words, was in fact a sign to Israel that God is active in the world at that moment, both in judgment and in blessing. That's you. That you dare to believe that in the midst of the small words that you speak, a word from God might flow through. A word from God might flow through. That's not hubris. It's faith. Are you qualified? (laughs) Well, heck no. Of course you're not. We aren't either. And which is why, in fact, Jeremiah protests. He has to play catch up to what God has been doing all along, preparing him for this moment, this unveiling of God's eternal purpose in Jeremiah's life. So it is with you. God has broken into your life and placed his call upon you and within you. For many, it catches us by surprise. We had other plans, but God had it planned out all along. That's not just how you got here. That's actually going to be the rhythm of your life. You have one plan. God says, oh, no, I have another one. And what is that call? It is, and listen to the word, to demonstrate the love of Christ. The call to the diaconate is not so much a call to believe in a certain body of doctrine. The ordination assumes you're already working in that area. But as so much as it is to act in a certain way. 
The examination in the prayer books is specific in its verbiage, using words like serve, study, make Christ's redemptive love known, carry out duties, show Christ's people. The call to, to the diaconate is a call to Christian activism, getting out in the world, not hiding out in one study, mixing it up with people on the margins, the poor, the weak, the sick, the lonely, and make no mistake, and I say this to all of my ordained sisters and brothers, the call to the diaconate lasts a lifetime. One does not graduate from being a deacon to priest, where at that point one may rule instead of serve. Once a deacon, always a deacon is not just a cliche. It's actually the Bible's understanding of the very nature of leadership. When priests and bishops forget that the call to servanthood is a constant, it's always a prelude to trouble, domineering leadership, power politics, emotional manipulation to get one's way, seeing human relationships as a means to an end, making oneself the center of attention at the party you went to last night, self-promotion, one of the great sins of Twitter, by the way. <laughs> no, you see, these are in fact what Paul describes as the shameful things that Paul renounces, the cunning behaviors that attempt to falsify God's Word by justifying behavior that Jesus specifically condemns. When unbiblical behavior, this is important, at least to me, is used and approved in the church, it lays the groundwork for undermining the very authoritative nature of Scripture and tragically supports the ethos of our post-Christian culture where I do what I feel is right with little regard to the teaching of Scripture, except, of course, those passages with which I already agree. I think this is exactly what Paul means when he talks about falsifying God's Word. Servanthood is the foundation on which all Christian leadership is built, regardless of office, be it bishop, priest, deacon, or layperson. As Jesus puts it, a servant is no greater than his master. It is not just that we are never above lowly tasks like cleaning toilets. It's far more than that. Servanthood is a lens through which we view the entirety of the Christian life, which means it means how I view each day. Lord, where and to whom and with whom would you have me serve? Martin Luther King in his sermon, I've Been to the Mountaintop, puts it this way, speaking about the parable of the Good Samaritan. He plays with Scripture, but his point's right. The first question, which the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Good Samaritan reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? You are not being ordained into a temporary office out of which you transition. You are saying yes to a permanent and costly way of life. No wonder the call by its very nature prompts us, like Jeremiah, to see our shortcomings in all the ways we do not fit with such a call. But listen, to object to God's call is not humility. It's a dodge, a way of changing the subject from God's call to my assessment of me and my own qualifications and shortcomings, as if God doesn't really know all about me as if God doesn't have no understanding of my experience of what it means for me to be me. You see, the good news of the gospel is that God knows me better than I know me. More often than not, God ignores our special pleadings and calls us to trust in Him and not our own self-assessments, just to follow Him anyway. The call will and always feels somewhat beyond us. We will always be more aware of the broken earthen vessel that houses the treasure that God has placed with, within us than the treasure itself. There will always be moments for which we repent when we choose not to serve, following our own selfish ways. It will ever be thus until we are taken into glory. 
But the good news is that God will from time to time surprise us with his mercies, joyfully use us in ways that we cannot imagine, be vessels through which the light of God shines, touching lives, some of which you see, some of which we don't, to our utter amazement. Friends, sisters and brothers, you're very different from each other, different seminaries, even in some cases, different nationalities, different family backgrounds. You actually reflect the new melting pot that is Central Florida. And I'm thrilled for every single one of you. There's not one that I would turn to my canon and say, well, you know, he or she just got by. I'm, I'm delighted for this occasion for each one. But I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to step into the arena of God's ministry, not based on your own perceptions of yourself, but instead following the leadership of the Holy Spirit and being obedient to what the Holy Spirit asks you, even if you have never done it before, even if you say, that is not my gift, even if you wind up saying, oh, but if I do that, I'll get into real trouble. Better to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and get into trouble than to play it safe and grieve the Holy Spirit. I'm not giving you in, an invitation to rebel. <laughs> but I am giving you a call to genuine, perhaps even politically suspicious, ecclesiastically on the margin servanthood. And no matter where God takes you in the life of the church, please remember, you never transition out of that place. Though the institution will fight, sometimes in a way that is quite nasty, to keep you on the inside, where it's safe, where the pay is good, where you're taking care of your kids, where you get the adulation of other people. But allow God to continue to keep your peripheral vision open to the person that you wouldn't notice had not the Holy Spirit come and tapped on your shoulder, to the situation where you, his call is a whisper in the midst of the strong temptation to just do the next thing on your agenda. Because I want to say to you, I believe with all my heart, is that the Lord of the whole earth is calling people to be out here. Out here. That out there, people might know the surprise, the joyful surprise, that the longing in their heart is in fact a call from God, and you are there to wash their feet and to learn from them is they tell you stories of what they see and know. And to take those stories back in here to us who are hiding out, calling us, as is your duty as deacons, to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. Amen.